My name is Tom Spohr. I'm the director of the Center for National Defense here at the Heritage Foundation. Delighted you're here. I'm an Army officer, former Army officer. That's good news for you because if JV goes too far into the area of thrust vectors and things like that, I'm going to pull them back into something uh, that I understand. So our focus today is on a brand new Heritage Foundation report titled, The F-35A Fighter is the Most Dominant and Lethal Multi-Role Weapon System in the World. Now is the time to ramp up production, written by J.V. Venable, who I'm sharing the stage with, is going to be discussing that report today. Not a uh, typical report that you see in the Washington, D.C. Uh, think tank uh, community. Usually those types of reports are based on uh, assessments of open source type material. This is uh, different, and so we'll talk about that. Hopefully you've all gotten a report if you wanted one. They were available in the lobby. Our focus today is going to be on the F-35A, the Air Force variant. Not to say that JV doesn't know about the other variants, but that's that's kind of how we're going to approach this. And in the Q&A, maybe if you have a question about one of the other variants, we could talk about that. Some have called the F-35 program the most expensive weapon system ever uh, aspired to be produced by the United States. I don't I don't know that that's true, and, and it all really... People cut this thing in all kinds of different ways. You can cut it in a 50-year chunk or a 75-year, however you want to cut it. It's an expensive program, one of the most expensive programs in our nation's history. And so, therefore, very much deserving of our scrutiny, our attention, and thus the, uh, our focus today. And so, about JV. JV Venable is a C senior research fellow here for defense policy, focusing on aerospace issues. He's a 25-year veteran of the Air Force who served in three combat operations, retired in 2007 as a command pilot with more than 4,400 hours of flying time and 300 of those hours in combat, principally in an F-16. He commanded the Air Force's Aerial Demonstration Squadron, the Thunderbirds from 2000 to 2001. So good morning, JV. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. In your paper, you broke it into the jet, uh, the simulator, uh, oper uh, maintenance and logistics, and operations. If you would, let's talk about the jet. Okay, um, the jet is, uh, is doing very well. And I, I'll uh, throw up a matrix for the folks in the audience, and I'm not sure that folks in, in the world of C-SPAN 2 can actually see this, but you've got the aircraft, the simulator, maintenance and logistics, and then operations. And those are the areas of a weapon system that you want to look at. This time, I wasn't just looking at the jet, but I was looking at the fighter itself to see how it improved. And it is, without a doubt, I walked away from the conversations, these 30 fighter pilots that are flying the, the combat version of the software and hardware, they feel it is the most dominant multi-role fighter in the world. Without a doubt, it has more situational awareness cues. Pilots, when I was flying and you checked and you turned away, your radar uh, turned away from the threat, you would have to look out the window and find a speck on the horizon, and that would be a fighter. If that fighter fired a missile at you, that would be an even smaller speck, and it was up to you to find it and survive or not find it and die. This airplane, the situational awareness cues, you can actually turn and your helmet will give you a display with a box over it of where that fighter is. And if he fires a missile, it'll show you where the missile is too. And that level of situational awareness just from an air to air perspective is unbelievable, but it has so many other tools that are not air to air oriented, they're air to ground oriented. It can find, fix, identify, uh, target and engage targets on the ground faster than any other weapon system in the world. And it does that through a variety of sensors. This is what I was told over the course of my discussions is when you get a hit with fighters flying out um, uh, side by side, maybe several miles separating them, they often get a, a, some radar or some system will actually come up uh, and start emitting. And as soon as it does, those two fighters will be able to triangulate exactly where that system is. And the AESA radar, this incredible ground mapping radar that they talk about, will slew over and actually map that ground and show you in a visual image as opposed to a radar depiction, the old school, 
exactly what that, that target looks like. And it will allow that entire flight to actually target and then go in and drop bombs on specific designated points of impact on that target. And this is what each of the pilots said. And so I won't go into any further uh, into that, but the pilots in an operational sense, and then this is, I'm talking about you're beyond the friendly line, you're in enemy territory, and you're going and engaging air to air and air to ground threats. The pilots that I, I talk to would rather not be in any other airplane, their previous airplane, or, or any other that they could think of on the planet than the F-35. That's the good side. Now, on the bad side, on the right side, or the not so good side, you have um, a, a concern that most of the pilots echoed. And this was the helmet that, that folks have. Let me see if I can get, would you call up, uh, Will, slide number six, if you would? Let's see if it can come up. There's the helmet. So an average fighter helmet, the one that I had, was basically a, a, a protective device. It had a hole up here where you could look out of and visors that you could pull down over your face, but nothing except um, uh, sunglass protection came down or a clear visor at night. That's all we had. When we started flying at night, we had to put a night vision goggle set and you would have it up on your head like this. And when you started flying at night, out of a, of a very lit area, you would crank those goggles down and it would be like two binoculars like you see out in front of this gentleman on the screen. That binoculars weighs about a pound, a pound and a half now. And the, the, the visual that you get out of that is actually pretty good. It's got about a 2040 acuity. So if you got 2010 eyesight like I do distance wise, then this will basically dilute that down to about 2040. And that's what you see. And those NVGs or NOGs is what we call them. They're getting better and better over the years, but still you've got this big honking device out there. It weighs a pound. If you turn the airplane and you apply G-forces to the jet, every uh, pound under four Gs weighs four pounds. You multiply it by the G number and that gets a lot of leverage on your helmet. The other thing is you're always looking left or looking right in the jet. And with me in the F-16, the glass was right here and I was always beating up that plexiglass with that, that, uh, that night vision goggles. So big ad, but they, they detracted from this and it's kind of like always having something on your back, right? It's always something there that you have to think about. The other thing about it is you've got these binoculars there, but if you look in the cockpit down, you can't see anything with it. Your map, any of the dials in the cockpit or the heads up display. And so you had to look underneath. You just shifted your gaze underneath it in order to see what you want. And so with the, the, um, the F-35, what they decided to do was build a, an HMDS, um, a helmet mounted display system. And, and those in the audience can see here that it's basically a, a little bit larger helmet, but in it comes all of the bits and pieces that you would find in the fourth generation airplane. That heads up display that you would find in a, in a fighter is there. But go back here to look at this, uh, the night vision goggle thing is no longer an issue. Right here in the center of their forehead, they have a, a high resolution night vision device and it basically projects onto that visor there, the helmet mounted display system. It projects in there, but it also, that display system also factors in the, the flight data, the targeting data, um, the, uh, the distributed aperture system we talked about a little bit before. And this graphic will give you an idea of what it looks like. Basically, it's six ports on the airplane. They look out in all directions. And in that helmet, you can turn your head and look, and it will show you what the airplane is seeing. But you can toggle a switch and look through the floorboard of the airplane and see underneath the jet. You can actually look and see through the engine, any quadrant that you want to look for. It genuinely does give you that Wonder Woman feel. You can absolutely look anywhere you want. That display is put right there in front of you along with the night vision device, the heads up display and targeting uh, and threat information. And so this kit 
has really got a lot of stuff coming into it. And what the pilots told me was that when they're flying at night on the tanker, you've got lights, you've got things that are coming off the tanker, you've got other aircraft that are in close proximity. And what they told me was the heat signature from the motors, the lights displays became very disorienting. And when you lift up the, the, that visor, if you did that in flight, you've got no data. You got nothing. There's no heads up display in front of you. You can look at the screens below you, but that's not in their habit pattern right now. And so what they have is a little bit of a conflict. This is, I know this sounds like it's very complicated air refueling, but it's kind of like you practice it so much as a fighter pilot that you've driven 30 miles on the highway and not remembered any bend in the road, right? You've all done that. And this is the same thing. When you practice air refueling enough times, it is a walk in the park. And so when you saddle up to the airplane, you look up, and now you can actually start taking your mind away, thinking about the tactical situation, what your next move is, how you're going to maneuver this 16-ship uh, package if you're the lead. You can do all of that while you're on the tanker. Well, this uh, HMDS has got some conflicts in it, and this is where the pilots told me that it was an issue. Is on the tanker, another administrative uh, chore. Fighter pilots generally don't think about landing, at least not Air Force fighter pilots. It's a taken for granted. You're gonna go in if the weather's bad. It's still, you go in there, this is what you do. It's not the mission. The mission is fighting. And so they had double vision at night landing because of the, the number of lights and the, and the brightness in and around the, the airfield, that became a, an issue. And so the HMDS is, is something that needs some work. And this is the, between the, in the whole system that I heard, this is the one thing that was recurring with the pilots is the, the HMDS. Would you go back, Will, to the number two slide? And that's pretty much the airplane. I, if I could go down a little bit of a, of a fighter pilot uh, lane, uh, it, this is a fun one to talk about. This airplane was given the, op, the, the name of a dog. It was, it was basically a dog in many people's mind for a long time. And, and they classified it that way because folks that were flying it had leaked out information that says it doesn't fly as well as the F-16 or the F-15 or the previous airplane that I flew. Well, when I flew with the Thunderbirds, or when you watch somebody fly in, in an air show, this is the kind of jet that you see. Underneath that F-16 on the lower left, it has no external stores, no missiles on the F-15 on the right. It has no pylons, no wing tanks, no ECM, uh, uh, electronic countermeasures pods, nothing. And we do that because one, it is fun, and two, you can max perform the airplane, right? It's something that you can go out and do. When we fight, BFM uh, go out and do that on a day-to-day -day basis in squadrons. Generally, we'll clean off the airplanes because you want to learn how to max perform the jet. And you want to gain that confidence. But this is all kind of a ruse. And it's a ruse for fighter pilots, too, because you have to think about what your combat configuration is going to be. And this is what the jets look like in a combat configuration. If you'll notice, the only jet that didn't change here is the F-35. Underneath the F-16 uh, center line there, right underneath the center of the jet, is an electronic countermeasures pod that weighs about 800 pounds. Uh, on the right side, you've got wing tanks. You've got we've, uh, they, uh, basically weapons mounts. We call them mouths, but they're basically stored uh, storage locations. Each one of those weighs a lot. And each one of those, when you're going through the air, it slows you down. The drag associated with it is significant. And so when you go to combat, that's how you fly. Even if you're going to go and you're going to fight somebody air to air, that's how you start out. And now when you've got this long range contact and you see a bogey on the horizon on your radar and you start coming in, if you don't get a kill at distance and you think that other airplane is at least as good as yours, what you have to do is hit a button in the cockpit that jettisons everything that's, that's departable from the airplane. With that, the wing tanks go, the bombs generally go, but every other piece of, of metal out there is still hanging. The targeting pod, the uh, harm targeting system pod, the ECM pod, and all the rails and all of that stuff, and it really is a drag-laden airplane. Even the F-16, it changed the way those airplanes flew. And so this, 
ladies and gentlemen, that's the configuration that you need to be concerned with when you're talking about fighting for your life in a combat situation. Now look at the F-35 there. It's the same jet it was to begin with. The weapons are internally mounted. The missiles are internally mounted. It doesn't have any targeting pod that has, is mounted in the chin of the airplane internally. Every other countermeasure that you've got is all internal to system. And so, Tom, this airplane is the, as clean as it is right now when it goes into the high threat environments. And this is the airplane I asked pilots to rate. And when they were going through, it's kind of hard. Anybody who's, uh, I know Todd Harmer is out there, been to weapons school. There's several folks in the room that have been. Uh, General Orville Wright in the front. When you go to weapons school, they make you fly in those configurations. And you have to learn how to fight somebody else who's clean in a dirty configuration. But most other pilots have to imagine that. And so this is what an F-16, and this is how the pilots rated the F-16. Up in the top, you can basically see the maneuvering capability of the airplane. And down below, those little purple bars going left and right, that's basically different air-to-air um, -air combat engagement type of situations. And if it's purple, more purple than it is white, that means that the guys picked, and the guys and gals picked the uh, F-35 over the F-16. As you can see there, almost every one of them picked it in most situations, but the very top line is really important because beyond visual range is when you're coming in and you get that contact on the nose at 50 miles, and now you can kill them at range or you may have to go in and you have to fight them in an old classic dogfighting sense. Every pilot that I interviewed, everyone from a fourth generation background said that they would pick the F-35 to be in in those long range contacts. And then when you get in the short range contacts, the reason why those numbers dropped is by and large because of the really capable missile that, that most Air Force airplanes have right now. It's called the AIM-9X. It's a dogfighting missile. You cannot carry the AIM-9X in a stealth configuration F-35. And so that weapon in a close fight is why those numbers drop a, a little bit in each one of the charted areas. If you've got a paper, you can look at each of the different systems the Air Force has. And by and large, the numbers dwarf what, what you actually get depicted there. If the F-35 had the AIM-9X in these situations, or I took it away from the F-16 in that situation, then the numbers would have changed, and they would have gotten even better for the F-35. And so this is the level playing field, Tom. Uh, long answer to your question, but that's the airplane. Oh, fascinating, JV. And so I, you were, we were talking the other day about why it's really not that important uh, close in because the other generations, fourth generation aircraft, are not going to survive to employ that AIM-9X in anything closer than beyond visual range. You're exactly right. And so in a perfect world, um, there won't be a fourth generation airplane that touches it. The situational awareness cues in this airplane are phenomenal. We built our formations when I was an F-16 guy to fly side by side to where you could look and check the six uh, or the, the area that was harder for the pilot in the cockpit to see. And you would be in a position to turn, call that guy to turn, and then shoot a missile at that bandit that was coming in. Well, this airplane has so many sensors and external feeds that sneaking up on it is all but impossible, at least in, in a non-EMP environment that we, we live in on a day-to-day -day basis. And so having those cues and that allows this airplane to go and do some extraordinary things that we never thought about doing in the Viper. Thanks, JV. Let's talk about the simulator, the thing that the system that the uh, Air Force uses to help uh, add to the training that uh, pilots get to, to employ the F-35. Yeah, Tom, uh, can we go, Will, would you go back to slide number two, please? Uh, here you can see how I've uh, graphed that, and that's the second line down. Uh, the sim is, uh, when I asked the pilots to rate the sim, initially they all said it was great, and then I started asking questions. I asked questions like, tell me about the fidelity of the sim. Tell me how uh, the interface works. Um, do you always get a pristine picture in the sim, meaning that if it's out there in the sim, you always see it, whereas in an airplane, that's not always true. Uh, mountains obscure targets, for example, things that you would not necessarily see in your target on your radar. 
And so when I started asking those questions, what I found was the average pilot, and it's more than the average pilot, thought that the simulator was a really important training device for part task training, intercept training, going out and figuring out how to target uh, multiple four ships as you're coming in in a long range uh, situation, or going through the switchology of the airplane. And there are so many switches and so many screens that you can cycle through in the F-35, getting that down to where its rote is really important. And I'll, I'll go down at burrow a hold here just for a second, Tom. We call things in the, in the fighter community habit patterns. Uh, you, you know, when you're ready to turn final, you have already put the gear handle down. And that habit pattern is always ingrained in your head. And you never forget that. Well, when you're out fighting, this habit pattern of you've got so many switches on the throttle and stick and so many screens that you have to have time to where you don't have to think about, okay, I'm going to flip that switch outboard and it will give me this display. You can't fight that way. You have to have this to where it's rote in your head. And that skill set, believe it or not, is volatile. So when you haven't parallel parked for three years and then you go in the city and try to parallel park in a tight spot, that's, that's tough. But when you do it every day, it's not as hard, right? Well, this is that thought process on steroids. And so for the switchology, the mechanization and the likes, the sim is a really good thing. And you can do classified engagements in the sim that you can't right now do in all uh, range airspace on a live fly situation. People can look out and kind of detect and, and figure out what you're doing, and we don't want that. But the downside of the sim is kind of what I've alluded to. It's the ideal world. Uh, it, if they don't inject weather into your situation, it's, it's the perfect day. You're flying in a perfect day. When you're flying in a simulator and your buddy is flying in another room in a simulator, you see exactly what they see and they see exactly what you see. And there's no issues with this communication in between the two airplanes. That rarely happens in the air. It, and when it does on a consistent basis and then it doesn't happen, figuring out what went wrong is really hard to do. And so this is why the uh, ideal area of the simulator is, is an issue. But more important than that, it's the software. The software in the, uh, in the F-35 drives everything. So you think that you know, software tell, allows you to push the screen and, and, and the switch up causes the software to shift things. Well, it's everything. It's absolutely the screen, the presentation, every facet of the jet is built on software. Every threat that the airplane has in its inventory is on software and it's updated on a regular basis. So I'm gonna to try to describe something to you. It's a little challenging, but if I was to tell you that if you got within three feet of me, I could hit you, you'd want a kind of a bubble around me, right? And you go, I'm not gonna get inside of that bubble. Well, the, the F-35 does that for every threat. And it figures out that he says he's got this swing, but he can't see me. He actually can't see me until I get within two feet. And so that bubble that it displays around the threat on the screen or in your, in your visor is dynamic. It breathes with regard to where you are. So in an F-16, you know, you're, you're fighting someone head on and you've got a big radar cross section. You turn to the side and it gets even bigger because of how it was designed and how it wasn't so stealthily designed. In the F-35, with the stealth in play, if your nose on, it's all but invisible. I mean, to any radar out there for a long way. You turn to the side, it gets a little bit more visible. And so that threat ring expands when you've got a little bit more aspect. Does that make sense to, to you guys? This ability for a threat, a SAM, to detect you and then hit you with a missile, you want to know where that is and it breathes and that's all based on this threat library, the software that's inside of the jet. Right now, the software that's been fielded is a software called 3F. The average simulator that's out there, even in operational units, is two derivations earlier than that. And so the threat libraries haven't been updated. They can't, for example, in the, S, uh, the S-400 is the most significant threat that's out there. And the S-400, you can't actually uh, employ against that in the simulator because the system hasn't been updated to incorporate that yet. And so many of the pilots use this term. It provides negative training. 
Negative training means you build habit patterns that will get you killed in combat or allow you to be less effective in combat. And so while that wasn't everybody, it was a majority of folks who used that term. It's all almost negative training. And so uh, this is a challenge. You only have so much money. Most of the money goes into the airplanes. You want it there. And then the next dose of that money is going to go into the, the, uh, the simulators as far as the software goes. And it just takes a while to get that up to date. Historically, I was in the Air Force for a long time, and we had high fidelity sims. And the sims were almost always a generation or two behind the software that was in the jet. And I don't imagine that's going to change with the F-35. And so this is an interesting one. But let me uh, go back to slide number seven, Will, if you would. And this is a uh, question that I asked. You can actually just hit seven and hit enter on that keyboard. Let's see, did I do that right? There it is. Um, I asked every pilot, okay, so the sim, the Air Force says the sim is a replacement for flying time in the jet, but it's almost that way, and it's going to get that way pretty soon. And this is the results. The red side of that is an absolute no. It does not replace the jet, time in the jet. And, and if you get the other ones, the next biggest chunk is they say for some things. Only, I think, one person in the entire poll said it, it replaces time in the jet, and that's out of the 30 folks that I interviewed. Time in the airplane is still the most valuable commodity. Excellent, Jamie. That, that was really good. Hey, lots of stuff in the press lately about maintenance, uh, logistics of the F-35. GAO came out with a big report, I think it was last month, talked a lot about issues with spare parts and stuff like that. I know you talked to maintenance people out at Hill Air Force Base. Can you describe to us what you found in your assessment? Yes, sir. Um, the Air Force bought a complete package. Uh, actually, all the services uh, in the uh, JSF, the J Joint Strike Fighter community, bought an entire package that involves a, a maintenance logistics piece called ALIS. Uh, it's the uh, Automated Logistics Information System, A-L-I-S. And ALICE basically is the thing that download, you, you plug ALICE into the airplane, it downloads all of the flight data. So if it had a malfunction, you plug it in and the, the jet will send the data into ALICE and ALICE will say, well, you need an empty frats part and you're going to need 20 guys to, or two guys or one guy to replace this. It's going to take three hours. It's a magical process on paper. And it's going to take us just like the jet. It's going to take us a little longer to get there. Alice, they love several components of it. So you all have uh, worked on your cars at one time or another. At least I, my wife makes me work, work on our car all the time. And I'll buy a shop manual. And if the shop manual is really good, it will say something like, open the hood of the car is the first step. Okay, I open up the hood of the car. Now, check to see, and it goes through a step-by-step -step basis. And if it's really good, it'll have a picture or a diagram of what I should do and what, what I should remove, how I should put it back on. Alice has this um, JTD module. It's a, a joint technical data module. And that has this on steroids. It's not just a checklist, but it has videos. It has diagrams. It has everything you need to go in and change it if you are a qualified technician on the airplane. It's an amazing system. With every new system that comes out, a new car, you think the wheel bearings are never going to fail on the car. And, and it was designed to never have a wheel bearing failure. But lo and behold, the manufacturer didn't pr produce a good part. And that wheel bearing has an issue. And now, if you didn't plan for that in your manual, your shop manual, then you go, well, how do I replace this part? And that's where we are with any new system, and that's including the F-35. When the F-16 came out, it had a lot of failures. We lost a lot of jets over my time, early years in the jet, because of maintenance problems that we weren't expecting. Um, and once we figured out what those were, then we could actually start a schedule on when to replace those parts before they failed and then have detailed schematics and joint technical data that was available that you could actually employ. And so the JTD data that's in this ALICE mode is phenomenal and no man maintainer that I talk to and certainly the chief of maintenance out there would not want to do without several of these modules which are so incredible. Um, it does have gaps in it, and those will have to be filled as this, the jet, we get more experience on the, on the airplane. There are other problems with the, uh, with the system, though, and, and you have 
programs that Lockheed Martin designed, digital programs that are working like a champ, but most of those go in and grab information from other programs, other modules in the system. And some of those are analog modules. And when those two meet, you very often have uh, system issues. And working out those bugs is gonna take a little bit longer time. So long answer to your question, uh, um, maintenance is doing great. The jet is flying incredibly well. The average F-35 takes off and lands and it has no discrepancies. They don't have to do anything other than top it off with gas for its next flight. That's all they have to do. It's actually much more than average. It's 92% of the time an F-35 takes off. It has no discrepancies. The next level is what we call the code two discrepancy. Hey, you know, my seat uh, height adjuster wouldn't go all the way up to the exact point that I wanted, but it still works and the next guy can fly it. A flyable, combat-configured airplane is a Code 2 airplane. A nitinoy irritant is what that would be. The Code 3 failures require some maintenance action before they can fly again. And, and this is a, a, an area where as the F-35 gains more flight time and the maintainers get more experience on the jets, then that will smooth itself out. And so all in all, the jet's doing really good as far as maintenance goes. But we've got some gaps that we're going to have to fill in with information. And um, uh, our office, uh, uh, the Air Force, our joint office on the other side of town, as well as each one of the bases is going to have to work to, to fill those gaps as quickly as we can. Your report talks, and I'll get this wrong, but there were pilots that were troubled by some of the delays they had getting their aircraft back up for flight the next time. Can you just talk briefly about Yeah, that? and this comes back into that analog digital yeah. thing. You, you, because it's a new system, you have to download data before you can actually do anything else, including fly the airplane the next time. You want to make sure everything is working. And there were occasions that pilots talked about in a very disgruntled and four-letter way about not being able to fly perfectly good airplanes because the ALICE system crumped. And so they've worked through most of those bugs and it's not happening now, but this is where those digital and analog ends meet. And, uh, and that, that's still, I imagine that's gonna be an issue for a little while longer. Great, JV. So the final area of assessment in your report had to do with the operations, how the Air Force is doing in bringing this aircraft into wings, into squadrons, how they're training on it. Can you talk about that? Well, uh, Tom, I'll tell you, you would be awfully proud of the, the folks at Hill. They have done everything they can do, and they've done it right. The maintenance folks have trained more maintainers than they need so that they can take those additional maintainers, move them to a new base as seed corn to bring the next wing that gets the F-35 up to speed faster. The F-35 operators, the pilots, have taken this time where the, 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 the sortie rates, because maintenance is a little bit slower, everybody's getting to learn how to new, uh, operate this and maintain this new jet. They're, they're operating a little slower. And so what they've done is they've done what most um, fighter weapon school graduates would be very proud of. They are doing one day long mission builds. So you mo do mission planning for an entire day. You brief the mission, you fly the mission, and then you go into every detail about the sortie that you possibly can. And, and that debrief will often take six to eight hours. That's what we did at weapon school all the time. And so they've taken advantage of the, the low sortie rates right now and operations has done a great deep dive and the average F-35 operator that's out there is really smart and he's really well schooled in the system. Unfortunately, they're not building experience as, as fast as they can. So pi fighter pilots in order to get better, you need more hours and you need more sorties. And in building that gives you not just um, the credentials somebody else needs to follow you, it gives you the skill sets that you need to have confidence to go out and lead folks. Over the years, we've developed this, this theory that even a knucklehead like me, if you give him 500 hours in a fighter, he can get enough experience where he can go out and lead people. He becomes quote unquote labeled experienced. Well, when you're only flying two, one or two times a week, you're not building that experience, that number of hours and the number of experiences through sorties that you need in order to become that pilot that you need to be to lead other folks. The sortie rates that the, the operators have capped because of these long um, mission preparation periods and long uh, 
flights and, and then debriefs, two days, taking two days out of the week for one sortie is a lot. And when uh, Orville Wright was my uh, ADO at uh, Torrejon, Spain, um, I was flying five or six times, and he was cattle prodding me all the way along to get more time, to get more experience. And that doesn't mean you're taking a shallow dive. You're only getting the experience. You're, you're taking the nuggets that you need. And you're not talking about, I thought you taxied five knots too fast out there. You don't talk about the little things, you talk about the big things. And so the shift that the operation is gonna need to make, and, and this is a critical side, uh, and, and a very small and nuanced side, the shift that the operator is gonna need to, to make is to take those two days and, and do those on occasion, but that's not the thing you do every week, every sortie. You want to put one of those in a week, and then you want to get guys out there flying another three or four times a week. And that allows them to build the blocking and tackling skill sets that you need to go out and execute the big game. If you have a slow learner, they need a lot more repetitions. And Orville will be the first one to tell you, I needed a lot of bananas in order to be a, be a better guy. But, but what we've done to date is we've hand-selected every flight school graduate to come into this airplane, hand-picked them. They're the best of the best in a flight school class or in, a pre in their previous operational unit. As the weapon system expands, we're not going to have the ability to do that. And so you're going to get John Venables in the unit, and you're going to need, them, need to feed them more bananas. And so that's the way I'll end. They're, they have done really an extraordinary job at Hill. This is just a tweak that I think they're going to need to make over the, the next year or two. Yeah, so last question before we go to the audience and, and see what your questions are, and that is there's kind of a, um, a baby elephant in the room, if you will, and that's got to do with the uh, Air Force's desire to purchase the F-15X. And I'm just interested, uh, in 2020 they asked to buy eight, and I think they aspire to buy 72 after that. I'm interested in having done this report, having talked to these pilots, what are your thoughts on that decision at this point? I'm sorry I didn't include this slide in the deck, but would you, Will, would you go to uh, five, slide five? Perfect. This is the F-16, F-35 comparison. And, and you can see that there, there are points on both the top chart and the bottom chart where people pick the F-16 over the F-35. Uh, maneuverability or dogfight situations, right? And, and so when you, if you were to look at the f 15E comparison to the F-35, and if you've got one of those reports, you can do it right now, you'll see that the numbers are flipped, and the F-15E pilots would never want to go back to the F-15E. This airplane dominates the F-15E in every category. Um, the, the weapons loadouts that people talk about, you can put 20 uh, missiles on an airplane, but if it never gets to the merge, if it never survives to, to fire one of those missiles, then that's what a high threat environment would mean to the F-15E. You're going to load up a lot of missiles and you're going to lose a platform and a human being because you sent them into a high threat environment. We, we can sit back and say, yeah, but you could use them in, uh, uh, to, to away from the high threat area and you could have them protect uh, tankers and, and uh, ISR platforms. Uh, that's true as long as they don't send their A-team, the Russians don't send the uh, SU-57 after their stealth fighter or the, Jap or the Chinese send their J-20, their stealth fighter. That's what you send after assets like that. And the F-15E will never see them, and, and then we'll lose both the F-15E and the, and the Havocap, that high-value asset. And so for me, uh, I, I would sit back and look at the data that is in the paper regarding the F-15E. The F-15X is a mirror image of the F-15E with a couple of tweaks on motors, perhaps, and on weapons loadouts. But otherwise, it's a big radar reflector, and it's not going to be valuable in 10 years when we're done fielding the F-15X. Thanks, JV. Yes, sir. Well, very good. So let's uh, go to the audience here. If you don't mind, wait for the microphone. Uh, give us your name if, and if, an affiliation if you have one, and, and summarize your question, if you would, so that we can get as many in as we can. Yes, sir, right here in the front. 
Uh, morning, Tom. Morning, JV. Uh, thanks for your time. Name's Chris Orr, former Air Force Security Forces Officer. Uh, unfortunately, the Air Force wouldn't let me uh, be a pilot or navigator due to a due to depth perception deficiency, so they made me a brown, a beret wearing ground pounding gun toter instead of protecting the birds. Thank also, you for doing what you did. Uh, yeah, glad grateful. You Roger that. Also, speaking of uh, the F 16 Lockheed Martin, the previous three and a half years I worked for Sally Port Global, uh, teaming up at Lockheed Martin in support of the Iraqi Air Force's F 16 program at Balad Air Base. And last but not least, uh, former Heritage intern and loyal donor ever since so chris long family side yes. chris we love you go on thank you okay so uh on paper at least how does the f-35 stack up against those near pair adversaries like the russian su-35 or the uh, chinese j-20 really good question and so uh if i cut to the quick and say we really don't know i guess that would be uh the answer that i could give you the s-400 is the the sam system that everybody's afraid of it's never been used operationally, so we don't know, right, um, how good of a system it is against a, a fourth generation fighter. We do know how it would do, we believe we know how it would do against the F-35, and, and it's not very good. It may be able to see it further out, but its ability to actually engage and hit the F-35 is not there. At least not yet, not in the open source. So you go to the J-20, and you, if you look at the J-20, there's a lot of similarities between the J-20 and the F-35 on the outside. Um, uh, on the inside, it's different. So stealth, we call, talk about stealth in terms of metal, right? You can't see it because you've got this shiny coating uh, uh, that's covered up by other stuff. And so you've got this stealth coating. But stealth is actually much more than that. Stealth is anything you can use to find me. So if I have a big beacon in my airplane and it's going off all the time and you've got a beacon detector and you've got something that can track and engage that beacon and kill it, um, then that's not stealth, right? It's only partial stealth. The F-35 is complete stealth. It's emissions, the way it uh, is emotes nothing um, is phenomenal. An F-35 cannot see an F-35. It's a very important statement, right? Can you see it with a, a heat-seeking ap uh, aperture? Yeah, you can in certain situations, but a European environment, a South Pacific environment where the humidity goes up or the weather comes up, then those IR devices go away. And so now coming back to your question, the J-20, they may have got some technology from us um, through pilfery. They may have done some of their own research, but I'll tell you the art and craft of making a stealth fighter is amazingly hard. It would be the equivalent of me showing you picture a picture of woodwork and you never having done work work and the tooling and, the, and, and getting in and not seeing what's underneath the cabinet, right? How the things are, are put together with regard to the legs and the likes. That's what's missing from anything you'll see in the J-20 or the, the SU-57 with regard from their ability to steal from us, right? You just don't get that craftsmanship. Um, I could tell you that, you, you know, all you need to do is iron a shirt and it'll look great. But actually ironing a shirt is its own skill set and you actually have to take the time to do that. Putting stealth coating on an airplane to where it makes the airplane not visible to radar or minimizes someone's ability to do that is its own art. Do I have confidence in the, uh, in the, uh, the uh, F-35? Oh, I, from what the pilots have told me, I've got a great deal of confidence in it. Do I have confidence that the Chinese and the Russians have been able to? I don't have that confidence. And so I would say we've, we've got a competitive advantage, at least for the next 10 or 15 years. We've got a big competitive advantage with the F-35. So I spent a little bit of time, what time is it? We've got a, a, just a, another minute or two. I spent a little time talking about how much flying time that people needed. Um, and what the, I actually asked this question, if, if you had the opportunity to fly more, would you? And most guys said, well, you know, I've got a lot of extra additional duties. I got a lot of this. And I go, okay, let me, let me turn this around for you. When I was flying, I needed a lot of bananas and I needed them on a recurring basis. And so if you, if you gave me two sorties a week, two bananas, I, I probably got worse at everything just a little bit. I, it, it took me a while to remember uh, exactly how to go to, I had to think about maneuvering my airplane to go beat somebody else. If you gave me three sorties a week, 
then I actually could sustain all of the things that you asked me to do pretty well. But if you gave me four sorties a week or more, I got better at everything. And it's the repetitive nature of this. And over the course of my Air Force life, this has been the mantra that most fighter pilots have said, two, three, and four. Does that still apply? I asked that to every F-35 pilot that I met. And what they gave me uh, was pretty startling. Uh, slide number eight. And so does this two, three, four mantra apply? Now, if you look at the experienced pilots, you'll see that 17 of the 21 that I asked said absolutely, and four of them said you could probably reduce that number by one. These are very experienced pilots. All of them have uh, in excess of 800 hours of fighter time in another fighter and two to 300 hours in the F-35. But look at the center. Every first assignment fighter pilot said that. Every one of them said that. And so when you begin to think that you have all the answers because you're experienced and you've kind of lost sight of how many bananas you needed as a young person in order to get to, to do the mission, it's easy for you to step aside. Now, I'll do a quick uh, question. How many sorties a week do you think the average Air Force fighter pilot is getting right now? You think he's getting two, three, or four? Uh, go to slide nine. Just go to the next slide. This is disheartening. So if you look up there, the average F-35 guy got 4.2 sorties a month last year. That's one a week. It doesn't even get to two. Uh, 20, F-22, five sorties a month, 1.25. And then if you look at the hour totals, this is really discouraging. When I was uh, uh, getting ready to fight the, uh, the Soviet hordes during the Cold War, we knew that the average guy needed 200 hours a year. And even experienced guys, if they got less than 150 hours of flying time a year, you couldn't take them to combat because they would, one, not survive, and two, probably take you down because of their inabilities in the airplane. Their lack of mutual support that they could provide because they were saturated with their tasks. Look at how many fighter pilots got more than 150 hours last year. That's where we wouldn't take anybody to combat, that threshold. And only the F-15E community on average made it above that in 151 hours a year. This is something the Air Force needs to turn on, and, and it's something that we will highlight again. But if you're in the aviation community and you've got the, a, a fighter background at all, you know that these numbers resonate. They resonate hard and fast. And, and we're at a point right now when guys are getting one sortie a week, you're having to think about everything. And, and if you remember, there was a movie, Right Stuff, a couple of years ago. And one of the astronauts got in the cockpit, and he's by himself, and it's Alan Shepard, and I think his prayer was something like, Lord, please don't let me mess up today, only he didn't use the word mess up. When you get in an airplane and you're flying one sortie a week, one of the things that you're thinking is, Lord, please don't let me mess up. And we're putting these kids in a square corner, and we need to get them out of it. And so I'll leave you with that. Is any other questions, Tom? Do you have anything that else came, that came to mind? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name's Todd Wiggins. Uh, uh, my site's called Meet Me DC. So I have a pedestrian question, which I don't believe has been covered. But um, with respect to vertical takeoff yes, sir. versus traditional long range uh, ascent and decline, do you have a preference and have you um, any thoughts about the future as, as to how viable vertical takeoff will continue to be? That's a great question. So um, the, the F-35B uh, is the Marine Corps variant, and it's what's called a Stovall variant, short takeoff, vertical land. And so it needs a, um, maybe a 1,000 feet, maybe a little bit longer runway than that in order to take off with a full load of gas and munitions. And then when it comes back, because it's burned all, off a lot of its gas and dropped a lot of its munitions, it can come back into a vertical landing. Uh, the Marines have had this as, uh, in their, their uh, uh, requirement bin since they got the Harrier. And they are still flying the Harrier, and they love it because of that's ability to go forward, be close to their troops, and you can have 
uh, a jet basically take off vertically or nearly so, go out in a very short distance, em employ that ordinance, and then come back and, and, and land. And do that over and over and get a lot of repetitions in and help their guys on the ground. Right? And so um, I, do I think that this is a viable um, argument? I love the argument. I love it. Uh, I, I, would, I would love to give the Marines as many of those airplanes as they want. The Marines are also buying the C model, which is the, uh, the, the carrier version with a lar larger wing that's not um, vertical uh, takeoff and land. Um, but what their, their basic number one premise is the guys and gals on the ground. Our job is to support them. Our job is to be there and in turn as quickly as we can and get as close as we can to that fight as we can. If you look at uh, another very odd uh, argument, Todd, is I want as many targets um, for the enemy to shoot at as possible. I, I know that's a horrible thing, but I want them to be so saturated with the number of avenues that I can, as a United States um, airman or a United States military person, I want to be able to hit them from so many directions that they have to defend in all of them. And by having this Stovall platform, I have that many more directions that they have to defend. Uh, is it, uh, does it reduce your carriage of munitions? It does. Does it reduce your, your performance with regard to how the airplane operates? It does. Uh, your gas, it reduces all that stuff. There are trade-offs. Um, and last thing I'll say is John Jumper back in 2002, 2004 timeframe actually was going to buy a, a B model variant for the Air Force to replace the A-10. And, and the reason why he was going to do that in my head anyway was that you want to preserve that incredible community we've got with the A-10. They do air to ground. They do close air support. It's their bread and butter. Anybody can go out and drop in a low threat environment. Uh, uh, and even I can do that and have where you can employ where there's nobody shooting at you. But when there's somebody shooting at you, you have to know the mindset, you have to know the nomenclature, you have to know everything about the people that you're supporting and the people that you're trying to kill on the other side. And our A-10 guys do that, and I think that's one of the reasons why General Jumper was leaning in that direction, was to preserve that community. J.D., before you leave, on behalf of the Air Force Association, Tom, thank you. Um, too often in this town, we talk about those who would risk their lives as we approach Memorial Day. JB, thank you very much because you went and talked to those who are going to give their lives for our country and you gave them a voice. So on behalf of our Air Force Association, brother, thank you very much. Thank you very much.